Hi, this is James Angle Full Capital, and I'm here with Scott with Insurance Claim Recovery Support. Is did I get that right? Sir. All right. So um Scott, maybe to kick it off, just give people an idea of uh your background and then um a little bit more about your company. Sure, yeah. Um, so I've been in the commercial and multifamily real estate space for over 25 years. Um, I have ownership interest in over 10,000 units around the country. Or I became a public adjuster, which is what we do today and have been for the last 15 years. And uh, we specialize in uh, commercial and multifamily large loss property damage insurance claims, representing only policyholders against the insurance companies uh, when they find themselves in large loss situations, um, which can be very complex and time consuming. Uh, we help them to navigate the process and avoid unnecessary litigation. Um, we've had a very good track record and we'll dive a little more into that in a bit, but basically we're essentially a private insurance, a private insurance adjusting firm that just represents the policy holders interests. Okay. So if, if I own an apartment, you know, I've got this long insurance policy that I maybe know the deductible and maybe know a couple items in there, but maybe yeah. not the the hundred yeah. pages in the the same thing with, you know, the loan agreement sometimes is, you know, it's 150 pages and not everybody's read every paragraph. And so what happens if, you know, whether it's a hurricane or a storm comes through, then you have a large um, claim. And I guess when, when they, when do they bring you in? Like, is it when they file that claim or do they want to hear back from the insurance company? Talk through sort of the timeline a little bit. It's the most common question we get asked other than how are you paid? And we do get paid on a contingency fee basis. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the question is, when do you bring us in? And so um, the short answer is as soon as possible, especially if it's large or complex, if it's over six figures, um, our experience has been you do not want to wait. Because what people do when they do wait is they think, well, I'm gonna see what they what the insurance company does, and then if I have a problem, I'll, I'll find I'll call I'll call them, and that's how a lot of our first time customers come to us. They're in massive pain. They've been grossly underpaid. Um, they're dealing with delays. They don't want to have to go through the entire litigation process. Most people would rather try to go through a non litigious process, which is what we definitely offer, also on contingency. Um, so as soon as possible is always the best answer. And the reason is that the insurance companies are required to give equal consideration to anything that supports a policyholder's position equal to their own interests. Okay. And, and it's important because the insurance companies, although they're required to perform a proper investigation and act in good faith, proper is very subjective. Okay. And I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years. We wouldn't be in business for 15 years if everybody's getting paid what they should be rightfully timely right so um that helps that helps move the move the process along a lot faster because we already know what the objections and what the issues are going to be before they get encountered so we try to head all that off and shortcut the time frame and just address all those issues kind of like in the lending environment there's certain things that you want to look at the, the credit worthiness of the, the buyer, the financials of the seller, right? There's all these different things that you use to qualify and then you make sure, 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 <laughs> that it's a good deal, right? Um, same thing with, with what we do. And then the flip side is the people that wait until they get something product from the insurance company. That process looks something like, well, they were really friendly when they came out. I thought we had a you know an agreement. And then two months later, I got this basically a stick in the eye. And then people call us after that. We look at stuff and then that's called a supplemental claim. Um, and the advice I always give to clients and prospects is that nine times out of 10, the lesser of the two fees is going to be based on if you just brought us in initially rather than wait. Because when you do a supplemental claim, the contingency fee is greater. So in other words, um, the, the maximum you can charge as a public adjuster in the state of Texas, and it's different in all states, is 10% of the settlement. So 10% less the deductible, that's the settlement amount, 10%, okay? When it's a supplement, meaning you feel like it's been shortchanged and there's additional monies that are owed, which we see routinely, um, that is typically 20% of new money, okay? But it's the lesser of the two. It's either 20% of new money or 
10% less the deductible, the lesser of the two. So what that means is basically, let's say we move the Delta by, let's say they're, you know, you're at um, a million and your insurance company's at 200,000, right? And let's say we move it to 300,000, right? So 30, a 10% of 300,000 is 30,000, right? 20% of 100,000 is 20,000. So the lesser of the two, those two in that example is the 20,000. However, most of the time when we've got a Delta that's that wide, nine times out of 10, we end up negotiating a much higher settlement amount that ends up being the 10% is the lesser of the two. And the point to all of this is that most policyholders are not saving time or money by waiting to get us involved. Now, I'm also gonna say that you don't need a public adjuster necessarily on every single claim, but if it is large, if it's complex, um, if it's got multiple roof systems or you've got storm damage or a fire, especially fires, um, you're definitely going to want to engage a good public adjuster. So maybe, um, so I think you said six figures was a good number, but let's say, you know, it's one unit and it's 30,000 or $40,000. That's probably not, they shouldn't call you on that with, you know, small well, claim, right? Maybe, or Yeah. Well, so just like lenders are all different, yeah. right? Um, y'all don't do, I'm assuming you don't do single family houses, right? right. I mean, yeah. maybe once in a blue moon for that special client or something like that, but that's how we operate as well. I mean, if we're working with a big property management company that has a billion in assets and they have this one issue with this unit, we're going to help them. Okay. Right. Or yeah, yeah, we can get yeah. calls all the time. People and feel free to call us. I mean, people call us all the time. And if we don't feel like it's worth papering up and we can just kind of say, Hey, try this. If that doesn't work, call us back. We do that a lot, okay. you know? So, all right, maybe, um, so we've given, we've talked about some examples, but any particular properties, uh, you don't have to give the name of the property, but maybe just at a high level, sort of, it could it maybe already been done this year. Um, talk about sort of what happened at the property and then uh, sort of uh, your process through the entire, entire deal. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. We recently just went through some of our old claim files just to kind of get a flavor for the percentage of increases. Um, and so, I mean, I'm looking at a whole list here. Our average is 604% increase, and that's including uh, two, three properties that had infinite increases, meaning the claim was originally denied, hmm. and we got a, wrong, a wrongfully denied claim reversed, multi-million dollar claims. Um, but you know, like here's a hail and wind claim, uh, 65% increase for a church. Here's one for an apartment complex wind only 163% increase. Um, here's an HOA condo again, infinite, completely reversed. Um, we have another church here that we got a 512% increase. We did a hotel that we got a 2,800% increase. No, 30, 3,800, sorry, 3,800% increase. A nursing home with a 42% increase. So, so on, on these are, are most of these where the initial claim maybe was denied and then they call you and say, Hey, you know, we think this is a reasonable claim, but we got denied and now you come in and okay. On the denied ones, it's definitely infinite. But on the other ones that I was telling you with those higher percentages, I mean, it's, it, it almost, I, it, you know, we, we <laughs> it's kind of funny. I've noticed a long time and I, I, I'm a little apprehensive about like posting this kind of stuff on social media. We never say anything about who the client is or the insurance right, company, yeah. but almost unbelievable. It's like, are these guys that good or the insurance company is really that bad? And to kind of give you a little bit of a uh, insight into that, it's basically like uh, the biggest issues that come up with, with property damage insurance companies are repair versus replacement disputes. Okay. Yeah. So in some of these cases, the insurance company may have said, Oh, well, we think that you can replace five shingles. And it's like, five shingles there's no way this is widespread damage and you know one of the bigger things that happens just like in your business people get what i call the gobbledygook like a, all these pages of documents and it looks really official right but it takes a trained eye to look at it and dissect it and peel through the layers and look for we find a lot of misrepresentations we find a lot of omissions we find a lot of baseless opinions that's baked into an insurance company's claim file and so a policyholder gets this I mean, they're lucky if they get their entire policy, first of all, they even, you know, you have to ask for it about a hundred times in some cases, but um, it's an exaggeration, but you know, you should have to ask for it one time and that's it. But the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, 
once you start peeling back all these layers and you start seeing all the omissions and you're seeing all the misrepresentations and you're seeing all these baseless opinions, then you can start like really dissecting what the insurance company is doing because you can't ever forget that the insurance company's representatives work for them. They work for their interests, not yours. And one other really important point I want to make is that most policyholders don't know that the burden of proof to prove up your claim damages is on you. It's on the policyholder. And people don't understand that. It's like, what do you mean? I thought my insurance company is supposed to do all this. No, nope. they just have a duty to perform a proper investigation. Proper, you know, what's a good deal? How long is a piece of string? This is all subjective things. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 one of those things where policyholder bears the burden of proving their claim. The insurance company bears the burden of proving that an exclusion applies. And so therein lies the rub. There's all there's an inherent conflict of interest built into the business model for insurance claim handling. And a lot of people will say like. Oh, I've never had a problem with my insurance company ever. Well, that's because you've been paying your premium forever, right? Have you had any claims? Well, no. Well, when you're paying your, your premium, you're an asset. When you file a claim, you're a liability. And insurance companies do two things really, really good. Collect premiums, manage liability. Yeah, so on on some of these cases that you, that you went through, um, can you talk about some of the things that maybe the the person you know the the owner um the any sort of best practices from the ownership side that maybe could avoided some of these or even um stuff that the insurance company maybe missed or the owner missed any i mean th yeah there's so much stuff i mean um just a couple we of had examples a, yeah yeah we had a recent claim a fire claim where the carrier you know the, the carrier didn't know that there was another policy. Like it was a layered policy with four policies. And I'm like, why didn't this get triggered? Like, oh, we didn't know there was another policy. I'm like, come on, guys. really? Okay. Um, uh, they never filed, the, the, the policy will never file a business interruption claim on a fire, right? It's, and, and I'm like, well, your adjuster should have said so it's something. like loss they, of rents? Is that loss of rents? Yeah, Is that what you're loss talking of about? rents. Yeah. And, yeah, and they're like, oh, okay. I didn't know. Did you guys want to do that? We're like, they guys, they guys lost 32 units yeah. in a fire. <laughs> And, and they've been down for six later. months. Yeah. 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 The, the, they, they're not banks. You know, they, yeah. that's why they have insurance. Yeah. You need to pay them business interruption losses, you know, okay. loss of. You know. so, so when somebody, bef when someone engages you, they send you the insurance policy and just um, pictures of the claim or like, what do you, what's typically like uh, on your side? Policy, engineer reports, any repair receipts, photos of damage. Um, any estimates from either the, their contractors or from the insurance company, any correspondence letters, um, reports. And, and also, because we're speaking to all these real estate investors in here, I'll tell you, because I remember I used to be a broker. We used to broker apartment complexes. Is, and that's part of what led me into this business is that, that, that due diligence process, okay? When you go and get your building inspections done, when you go to get your appraisal reports done, a lot of times that's good documentation to use for pre-loss condition. Okay, because a lot of times the insurance, oh, that's that's pre-existing damage. It's like, no, no, no. Well, we have these photos that shows that it wasn't. But now you try or the marketing setup from the brokers, you know, they've got lots of photos, too. So that's that's part of what they can do. And, you know, another thing that I always tell um, the owners is if you have temporary repairs that need to be made, make them. You have a duty under your policy. It's a contractual obligation to mitigate the damages. In other words, they have to protect and preserve the property. They can't just let it get worse. They can't just go, I got a hole in my ceiling and that's, that's not my problem. Right. It is, you know, and pay your contractor to do those repairs and show that you made it have a receipt. The name of the game is documentation and reasonable efforts. Okay. Um, anything, I mean, the insurance market is, uh, I don't know if it's crazy. Hopefully it's settling down. Um, anything that you're seeing on that front? Uh, I mean, you know, everybody knows the premiums have gone crazy high policy benefits have been diluted. Um, hail and wind deductibles and named storm deductibles have gone up. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting environment. And, and especially when you're doing commercial properties, multifamily, those are all surplus line carriers. So all the policies are a little bit different. Um, 
What so does that I mean? Would say, what does that mean? Surplus line carry. I don't. Even, I don't it know. It means mean. okay. So so just like in in in, in the real estate world, you've got your one to four family yeah. type stuff, and then yeah. any over four family is considered commercial. Right. It's kind of that same principle with insurance. Yeah. So if you're an admitted carrier or um, you're you're you have uh, um, uh, basically what I would say a retail policy. Okay, that's been approved by by the Texas Department of Insurance. That's that's basically for your single family stuff. Okay, yeah. your, your smaller stuff. When you get into a bigger property, like the stuff that you guys get involved with and your your audience, that's commercial and multifamily. And those are surplus line carriers. And so that's why you'll see like multiple layers sometimes on certain policies. You're like, what is, why is there, there's like seven, eight different policies. There's a master policy with like all these different insurance companies on there, which means they all have to issue separate checks. Um, and so when it's a surplus, and there's a whole bunch of other things that go into being a surplus policy per TDI, um guidelines but i don't want to get into all that gobbledygook the bottom line is that when it's surplus line um insurance it's they can all, every policy is is different okay whereas in the residential world it's they're, they're not exactly the same but they're all pretty boilerplate pretty much boilerplate yeah most people aren't negotiating all this stuff on a single family insurance policy it's just sort of whatever they get to some extent right Actually, that's true <laughs> on all basis of insurance. And that's a very good point because um, unlike the contracts that your audience deals with on a daily basis of negotiating with buyers and sellers, your insurance policy is take it or leave it. You don't get to negotiate. You can't say, well, I know you guys want a 2% deductible for Halo Wind, but I want to get that down to $5,000 and then we've got a deal. Right. It doesn't work like that. Well, they'll say, so, yeah, your premium is going up by 10 X. If you want. Right. Well, or, or, or the policy is the policy. Like you can't, yeah. you can't sit there and go, well, I don't want only um, a 12 month um, time to, to, to complete my repairs, which by the way, is a time element that, that policyholders need to be aware of. Um, you know, I, I want, I want, I want two years. You don't get to do that. So because of that, because of the insurance contract is a take it or leave it contract. That is why insurance companies are required to act in the utmost good faith because the consumer has no bargaining power. Okay. And so that's why there's these strict, um, thank God, Texas has strict um, statutes for bad faith insurance claim handling practices. And there are penalties for that. So the penalties are in place to try to, to um, you know, deter them from delaying, underpaying, uh, prolonging, forcing people to sue, that kind of thing. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it happens every day. <laughs> right. Well, uh, Scott, thanks for jumping on today. What's the best yeah. way for people to reach out to you if they have a question? Sure. Yeah. The website's insurance claim recovery support.com. Bless you. Thanks. <laughs> Again, that's insurance claim recovery support.com. Uh, my cell number direct is 832-725-2878. Um, you know, we're happy to help answer questions, review policies, look at claims, give you an opinion. If there's something there, we'll tell you. If there's nothing there, we'll tell you. I mean, not, you may not like what we tell you, but we will tell you what you need to know and may not necessarily be what you want to hear. All right. Great. Uh, well, you'll be at the conference in October, the Old Capital Conference. So I appreciate you jumping on just to give a little bit more information today. And uh, I'll see you in a couple of months. We're excited to be there. See All you right. soon. See ya. Thanks, James.